Well, here we are. This is the third Sunday of the new year. Um, and it's my first opportunity to preach in 2023. Um, and so I guess what's on my heart this morning is that um, both Andrew and Adam um, have shared with you the invitation and the leading and the direction that they've see, received from the Lord as we begin a new year together. Um, and so that's something that I really have on my heart to do with you this morning as well. Um, I hope that as we get into it together, uh, you will see just the beautiful way that the Lord weaves things together um, and that we serve the same God and that in fact what he is saying to us as a congregation has um, some consistency and theme to it for 2023. Um, and obviously this is a time of the year where there's lots of comings and goings and people arriving back from holidays and people who are heading away and um, we were talking in the prayer meeting this morning about these strategic groups of people. There are those people who are still beholden to the school holidays who are utilising this time now and then there'll be the strategic people who don't need to worry about school holidays who are waiting till February to go away because then they don't have to deal with all the school holiday traffic. But... Um, it, uh, what I want to do, that all that to say, that what I want to do is encourage you that if you have missed any of the Sundays kind of as we start a new year together, I would really encourage you to go back and get hold of uh, the sermon. You can do that either through um, a, your podcast app or you can do that through our YouTube channel. I think I say this every year, but I have found in the 20 years that Justin and I have been coming to Vision that, I mean, as, as, as God's people, we have an individual responsibility, obviously, to come to the Lord and to seek the Lord for his leading and his direction in our life. But there is something significant about seeking the Lord for his direction more corporately. And I've found without fail that every year... Um, God brings these incredibly faithful words of wisdom and leading and guidance for the year, whether that's through a scripture or a particular phrase. And what I find is that as the year unfolds, it's always very helpful to go back and be revisiting and reminding myself of what God has said. And, you know, sometimes that is much needed encouragement. Sometimes that will galvanize us again in remembering what has God said to us at the beginning of the year and how is that outworking in my life. Um, and it just helps to cast a direction for us. And so just as a very quick recap, because I think it helps frame today what I want to share. Andrew, on the first um, day of the year, issued a challenge and an invitation to us um, using as a basis of his um, sermon, Exodus, and just reminding us that we are not to lose sight of God in our midst, that it's very easy to go looking for what God can do for us, but to not seek after and look for his presence and for his very self. And so um, one of the things that really was a takeaway for me was that in 2023, that we are to cultivate a growing expectancy that we will have a, an increased awareness of God in our midst this year. Um, and then last week, Adam spoke about making room for Jesus. And you can already see this theme weaving through um, what God is wanting to say to us as we start the year. And Adam challenged us that what we make room for, using the dessert stomach as an example, um, is what we treasure and value. And that as we begin 2023, to start with this intention that we are to pay attention to God in our midst and ensure that we are intentionally turning aside to pay attention to him and make room for him. And so I also sought the Lord this year with... Um, a sense not only for my own personal life, but what he was wanting to say to us as his church family here at Vision Church. And he started this year with me with one word, and that word was congruence. Now, I have to be honest, this is not a word that's particularly familiar to, you, to me, and I found that as I mentioned it to a couple of people in passing over the last couple of weeks, it's not a particularly familiar word to others either. In fact, I found the, 
part of the reason for this in my own life, which is in my research, it's actually used somewhat as a mathematical term. And let me tell you, this is not my strength or skill set maths. So um, I, that explains why it's not familiar to me. Um, I probably am more familiar with the opposite word, which is incongruence. But I have to say that I don't know that I would have still been able to define that for you. I might have been able to use it in context, but I wouldn't have really been able to tell you what that meant. So in case you're like me, um, and you know, I would encourage you, if God gives you a word or you have a sense of something, like we are to go digging for that and to actually see, well, what does that mean? So I started with some good dictionary definitions, which I'm going to share with you, just so that we can start with an idea of, well, what, what, how would that apply to us? What does it mean? What does congruence mean? So congruence means compatibility, harmony, and consistency. And in the field of psychology, because it's also a word that's used there, it means that there is a consistency between goals, values, and beliefs, and our behavior. So incongruence is the opposite of that. It means this lack of consistency, harmony, and compatibility. An example applied to our life would be when our behavior contradicts our words, or when our beliefs and our practices don't match up. And so I've had the benefit of a couple of weeks sitting with this word with the Lord. And so I want to just give you a couple of examples of my own life using that word as a filter to reflect back over 2022 and to help me look forward to 2023. So um, many of you would know um, um, at least of one of my key goals for 2022 because I wasn't shy about sharing it. And that was to run an ultra marathon. And then the other of my significant personal goals for um, 2022 was to spend more intentional time with our family, with our children, yes, but in particular with our ageing parents who had been experiencing a number of significant health challenges. And so one of the things that I do when I'm looking back on a year, because sometimes it's hard to know what fitted in that year, was to look at my camera roll on my phone. And what I found when I did that was there were a lot of pictures of running with friends and pictures of scenery out in the bush because I trail run. And there were a lot of pictures of family events, gatherings, and actually a lot of photos of us just doing ordinary, everyday things with our parents. And so for me, there was a sense of satisfaction that my photos demonstrated a congruence, to use that term, between the activities that I'd engaged in for 2022 and my goals and my values for the year. However, when I looked honestly at my consistency in um, other areas of my life over 2022, particularly in this area that I'd written in my journal at the beginning of 2022, that I really had a, wanted to have an increased desire to hear the Lord more clearly and to know him more deeply and to see him move, particularly in um, some areas of my life and my family's life. And what I found is that there was this incongruence between this expressed value and desire for him and my actions. Now, I'm not confessing from the pulpit that um, I was in outright rebellion. That's not what it looked like for me. But as I looked at through this filter of congruence and this desire as I started 2022 with the intention of hearing the Lord more and knowing him more deeply, what I saw was this sneaky, subtle, creeping complacency, which looked like, in my life, a lack of discipline and consistency to some of the things he'd asked me to do over the course of the year, and just a failure in my priorities. And I found that challenging. And um, I'm saying up front this morning that some of the things that I want to share with us this morning will be challenging and a bit uncomfortable. Because when you start looking at, is my life congruent with a life of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, most of us will have to answer truthfully, not in all areas. So I was looking up congruence, good old Google, 
And um, I found this quote by Eugene Peterson, who, if you don't know, know Eugene Peterson, among the many things that he did in his lifetime as a pastor and writer, he produced the paraphrase Bible, The Message. And he wrote in a sermon to his congregation or into his newsletter to his congregation years ago this quote. If there is a single word that identifies the faithful life, the godly life, the life devoted to Jesus, to the way of discipleship, it is congruence. Congruence between what we say, what we do and who we are. And I found myself thinking, well, if this is congruence as a follower of Jesus, then surely this is what all of us should be pursuing for 2023, a faithful, godly life devoted to Jesus and his ways. And so as we begin 2023 together, it is worth pausing and asking ourselves, are my actions, my choices and my life congruent with my faith and belief, with my declaration that I am a follower of Jesus. The Bible, of course, doesn't use either of the words congruent or incongruent. But this notion of consistency between what we believe, what we value, what we say, and our actions are woven throughout it. I think you'd agree. And James, in particular, has a lot to say on this. And so that brings me to our passage for this morning, which is James 4. Now, I I feel like James 4 needs to kind of have an upfront content warning. Um, As I said before, don't expect to feel comfortable reading a passage like like this. It's a pretty intense passage. And um, I did ask God for another one, but he wouldn't give me one. So... um, So what you're seeing is my own discomfort with just how harsh it sounds. Um, But this is my plan, just because I want us to stay together on this and to stay focused on this. My plan is, the Lord willing, that we will read this passage of Scripture, that I will give you some of the background um, that led to this um, um, letter that we will unpack it and what we'll do is together we will trust the Holy Spirit to help us both hear and apply it, which is something that James talks a lot about, and that we won't just write it off as something for the sinners down the road, that we'll actually look at how does this apply to my life. So if you have your Bibles there, we're going to one-handedly, I'm going to get to James 4. And we're going to read verses 1 to 10, but in particular today I am going to focus us in on verses 4 to 10, just so that as you read through it, um, you know where we're going to be paying the most attention. So James 4 verse 1. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you asked wrongly and spent it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will exalt you.
I find it interesting that this letter would have been read out loud. It, it was, wouldn't have been read in their heads. In fact, I was listening to something the other day that said um, that's a, actually a much more modern skill. In antiqu antiquity, they didn't actually read things to themselves in their heads. That's something that people have to be taught, which we do get taught at school. But um, they would have read things out loud, even if they were actually reading them out loud to themselves. But this would have been read out loud. And I guess the background that I want us to have as we think about the context of James's letter is that James was a key leader and a pastor in a church in the church in Jerusalem. The church in Jerusalem themselves as a church body were besieged by trials, famine, poverty, persecution. And James wrote this letter as a pastor leading in that context in a church that was phenomenally under pressure. And I think it's worth noting that he wrote this not long before him, he himself was martyred. And so I think when you think about the urgency with which he's writing and what must have been going on around him, it, it, it pays for us to pay heed to that. He indicates at the beginning of his letter that he's actually writing to a broader audience than his own local congregation. This isn't just the church newsletter. And that he's writing to believers that who, who have been scattered all over the Roman Empire. And of course, unbeknownst to him, when he penned this letter, he was writing to all Jesus' followers and to us. His letter encourages believers who were facing trials to develop a mature and consistent life of faith with this emphasis on practical action. And what he did was that he challenged his hearers, because it was read out loud, to not drift into apathy and to give in to their sinful desires, but to be constantly alert to realign their ways to the ways of Jesus while living in the world. And you'll find throughout his letter that he rails against hip hypocritical believers who say one thing and do another. In the context of our sermon this morning, we'd call that incongruence. And he places a spotlight on the necessity for believers to act according to their faith, which we would call congruence in the context of today's sermon. Believe it or not, his heart was very pastoral. He wanted the body of Christ to act like God's people and to pursue a life of holiness. So another way for us to put that is he wanted them to live a life that was congruent with their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no doubt that the wording that James uses in this passage is absolutely full on. He doesn't hold any punches as he challenges his audience on how to live. I have to be honest, the wording to me feels like it's a bit much, even a bit triggering. And I found myself thinking about some of those ad campaigns in the kind of 80s and 90s where they use scare tactics scare tactics from everything from smoking to trying to cut down road deaths and, and even um, cutting down the AIDS pandemic. And what they found is that those scare tactic ads were of questionable efficacy. So I found myself thinking, is it really necessary? Like, doesn't that just make people switch off and skim over it and think, well, that doesn't apply to me because I'm not that much of a sinner. Wouldn't it be better if he used phrases like the Apostle John, my little children, I'm writing to the, these things to you so that you may not sin. That just feels a bit more comfortable and kind than yelling, you adulterous people. And yet I also know that sometimes we need a wake-up call, a gut punch, something that causes us to stop and change direction. In our life, that might be a health challenge that reminds us that we have to make some radical life change, lifestyle changes or to finally go and get that test that we've been putting off immediately. Or it might be a near miss on the road when we're changing a podcast on our phone that reminds us that our driving habits have become a bit complacent. Or the realisation that that sneaky morning habit of just checking the news or social media has ended up with us losing 45 minutes of our time and now we don't really have time for prayer or reading the word. I guess what I want to say to us is that I want us to view this 
passage of scripture from James as a punchy wake-up call and a call to action. Something that causes us to re-examine if the outworking of our faith is congruent with what we say we believe as followers of Jesus. James challenges us with a number of broad areas throughout his letter. And I would really encourage you, if you haven't read it recently, to read the whole five chapters. But he challenges us on our actions in trials, our treatment of the less fortunate, how we should speak and relate to one another. He has a fair bit to say about that. And also the role that money plays in our lives. But in this particular passage that we've read today, he names two things that I want us to hone in on. That's friendship with the world, or we might call that worldliness, and being double-minded. So what is friendship with the world or being um, or worldliness? I want to be clear right up front. James is not calling believers to avoid befriending people in the world. That is not what he is talking about here. But what he is challenging us with throughout his letter and calling it out very specifically in this passage we've just read is that we are to resist befriending the values of the world. According to the Apostle John, worldliness is living opposed to God's word, his wisdom and his ways. It is living incongruently with the values of the kingdom of God. And therefore, James says, because it's living incongruently or opposed to the values of the kingdom, it's actually living opposed to the king himself. We should take that very seriously. It, if each of us was to take an honest hard look at ourselves, we would all agree that in the ordinariness of life, we can drift, we can become complacent and too comfortable with the values of the world. And that's consciously and unconsciously. I mean, you know the analogy, don't you, of the frog in the pot and then the water gets turned up and the frog doesn't even know it's cooking because it doesn't realise the temperature of the water has changed. It's very easy for us, consciously and unconsciously, to just become a bit too comfortable with things that are contrary to the values of God's kingdom. And then what that does is it makes us more apathetic towards him, and then we become more consumed with other things rather than Christ and his call in our life. When that happens, we live incongruently. We don't live in congruence to the things that we profess, that we believe. Double-mindedness is how James describes this state of being. And that word, literally, when you look it up in the Greek, means divided interest. We might use the word like having a foot in both camps or having a divided heart. And James says that a double-minded person, he says this in his in the first chapter of James, a double-minded person is unstable and in constant restlessness, all stirred up and tossed about. Like there's no sense of peace in the life of a person um, who is double-minded. And so I would like to suggest that in fact these feelings of being kind of plagued by being tossed about, being constantly in two minds, I'm I'm not talking about... um, you know, the odd moments that all of us have in our humanity, but just being plagued by being in two minds, constantly in doubt and overly confused in our walk with Jesus, that these are all warning indicators of double-mindedness in our life. It's like kind of that red light that pops up on your car dashboard and you'd be dumb to keep driving without stopping and working out why is that there and what do I need to do about it? And so this sense of loss of peace being all churned up, um, if, we, if we extrapolate from what James says about what double-mindedness does to us, we need to make sure that that is not at the root cause of what's going on in our hearts and minds uh, and where there may have been a bit of scope creep, if you like, in our lives where we've become complacent about things and are started to allow things into our lives um, in subtle ways, or that we're not doing things that we should be doing. 
James urges us, cleanse your hands, purify your hearts. In other words, check your actions and your motives because you need a course correction. And I guess that's what I want to encourage us with this morning, this sense of realignment um, with God and his kingdom and his purposes in our lives and in the lives of those around us. None of us, not one of us here, can claim to live a fully integrated, congruent life. Not one of us, where all our actions are consistent with the values and beliefs that we've received from Jesus. He is the only one who lived a perfect and sinless life. And so my heart this morning is not to trigger shame. It's not to present something to us that is completely impossible for us. And, and, and I hope that as we move on in this passage, you'll see that provision has been made for us. We won't ever perfectly do it. And it's absolutely true that change, transformation and formation of Christ in us, that means becoming more like Jesus, that happens over time. It's a process. But even in that, I felt challenged that I was thinking about this and I'm trying to soften it into my own life. Because how often do we say, oh, I'm a work in progress, oh, nobody's perfect, oh, I'm only human. I guess the challenge for us is in that truth that transformation is a process in our lives, do we lean a bit too heavily into that as an excuse for areas of our life where our friendship with the world has caused us to become complacent and double-minded? And only we can examine that with the Holy Spirit. Like... You know, the motives of our heart um, are something that we need the Holy Spirit's help to expose and bring to light in us for the purposes of freedom. And so before we despair at this really hard passage, this passage that you think, God, like, could this just be a little bit softer? Before we despair and think, well, Lord, I'm not living a congruent life. There are areas of my life that have got very wishy-washy. There is hope. You know, right buried, right in the middle of this really hard passage where he's using really hard words. James writes this, but he gives more grace. But he gives more grace. That means greater grace. His grace is greater. He gives a greater grace. It's not a grace that excuses but a grace that convicts us and is able to form and transform us. It's a grace that causes us to become uncomfortable with the worldly things that we've become too comfortable with. It's an enabling grace that strengthens us to take action and participate with the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's a grace that awakens us to a longing to draw near to God. It is a grace that reminds us that we cannot restore ourselves. And it is a grace that demands a response from us. And of course, good old James provides us with a list of how we can respond to this incredibly great grace. I don't know about you, but the longer I live, the more shocking this idea that God just keeps extending his very great grace to me is. And and I hope that you can grab a hold of that this morning as we look now at the ways that we can respond to his enabling grace in our life. I want to just reread a few verses from chapter 4 and then we'll um, bring it to a close by just fleshing that out a little bit together. So verse 7, submit yourself therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands you sinners and purify your hearts you double minded, be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord and he will exalt you. 
What I want you to notice first up is that our response requires change. First of all, it requires a change in position. We are to move away from and resist the devil and worldliness and we are to move towards God, drawing near to him and submitting ourselves again to him. So first of all, our response is a changed position, moving away from and towards. And then secondly, it's a change in heart that leads to a change in living. And this, in a nutshell, is what true repentance is. It's a stopping and changing direction in our hearts, our minds, and our actions. It's a turning away from and moving towards God. And so as we bring this to a close this morning... I just want to look briefly at the steps that James highlights that each of us can specifically find ways to respond to the Lord in. Number one, we are to humble ourselves by submitting ourselves to God and drawing near to him. It is really important for us to remember when we're dealing with an area of incongruence in our life and the desire to realign our life and our ways to the ways of Jesus, that it is his kindness and his grace that corrects us and leads us to repentance. It's only shame that tells us we need to go and hide, and shame is a lie. What we are to do as people who believe in Jesus is to run into his arms of grace, not away from him. And in doing so, what we're acknowledging is I can't fix myself. I can't absolve myself. I am utterly dependent upon your mercy, Lord. So be humble. The second thing we need to do is we need to ask the Holy Spirit to help us identify worldliness. Sometimes because we go in there with um, like a forklift and um, trash ourselves in the process and sometimes because we go in there a little bit too delicately and fail to recognise what's going in in our lives. The bottom line is we need the Holy Spirit to help us to take stock of where our friendship with the world um, has become... um, making us double-minded and that it's crept into our lives and that the values of the world are now taking a greater place in our lives than the value of the kingdom. And what I want to encourage you here is to get specific and to name it. It's not enough to just say, well, God, I'm getting a little bit worldly. How? How is he talking to you? What's going on in your life? Where is the incongruence? Where is he showing you and bringing correction into your life about areas of compromise or complacency? Then James tells us we need to grieve, mourn and lament. That's um, particularly when we want to be able to talk also about the joy of the Lord. It seems like a really... um, harsh invitation but what I want you to view it as is a temporary invitation it's a temporary invitation to grieve and mourn and lament and to sit in the weight of our sin and compromise and the reason we do this is so that we don't minimize it or brush it off too quickly this is not about self-punishment this is not about making penance and it's certainly not about being showy or self-pitying What it's about is that what should grieve our hearts when we fail more than anything is not that we failed, but that we've grieved the heart of God. And so we are to grieve and mourn and lament that and to sit in the weight of that. And then we're to confess it to God, to talk to him, to draw near to him in prayer and to confess to him specifically how we have been complacent, how we have compromised, where the values of the world have become more important than the values of his kingdom. And we are to receive his forgiveness. This is a really important step. I'm very grateful to mentors in my life who highlighted this to me in the early years of my walk with the Lord because I feel like I might have just stopped with the confessing it. 
And so I actually, um, some of you will have been encouraged by me to do this, but I will actually say out loud after I've confessed to the Lord, I receive your forgiveness and your cleansing from unrighteousness. That probably shows a bit of my Anglicanism in there. But um, saying out loud that we receive his forgiveness is really important. He is faithful to forgive us. And to hear ourselves say that out loud is really important. So receive his forgiveness. I'm no longer sitting in the weight of my sin. We're receiving his peace and his freedom and his very great grace and mercy towards us. And then finally, looking at James's action list for us, we are to commit to action and the discipline required to participate with the Spirit for change and transformation. We must remove and restrain those things that have been feeding our friendship with the world. And then what we need to add in and pursue are those things that foster our friendship with God. So again, it's that double movement of we're moving away from, we're rem- in, in our actions, removing and restraining those things that have been feeding um, our friendship with the world and including and moving towards and pursuing those things that foster our friendship with God. I wonder if I can ask the worship team to come back up at this point. My prayer for us, I think, is expressed very well in Paul's follow-up letter to the Corinthians. Many of you would know that he sent them some pretty punchy letters. And in 2 Corinthians, the second letter to the Corinthians that we have access to, in chapter 7, he writes to them about the seeming harshness of his letter. And I'm actually going to read this from the message paraphrase because I feel that it phrases it really well. But I want you to grab a hold of this this morning as we bring things to a close. This is what Paul wrote to the Corinthians. The the letter upset you, but only for a while. Now I'm glad, not that you were upset, but that you were jarred into turning things around. You let the distress bring you to God, not drive you from him. The result was all gain, no loss. Distress that drives us to God does that. It turns us around. It gets us back in the way of salvation. We never regret that kind of pain. And now, isn't it wonderful all the ways in which this distress has goaded you closer to God? You're more alive, more concerned, more sensitive, more reverent, more human, more passionate, more responsible. Looked at from every angle, you've come out of this with purity of heart. And that is what I was hoping for in the first place when I wrote the letter. It's my prayer that this year we would be more alive, more concerned, more sensitive, more reverent, more human, more passionate and more responsible. That we would be becoming more like Jesus. And so as we begin another year together, what I believe the Lord is doing is giving us a call to action, a wake-up call, if you like, that there is an invitation to us corporately and personally to engage in this process of cleaning the house and putting things in order, to lean into and live towards this call to congruence, and wholehearted devotion that we would actually intentionally make room for Jesus and to get ready for surely God is in our midst. It's been very intentional and I feel on the Lord's heart this morning for us to have communion 
by way of response this morning. Um, Let's be honest, none of us are going to do the full and hard work with the Lord that most of us need to do sitting all together in church. But what I want you to do this morning is to take a step towards the Lord in that process of allowing him to begin to examine your heart and to highlight to you the areas in your life that he wants to bring to your attention. And then I want to encourage you not to just simply file this and the other words away that um, the Lord has brought for us this year as we start the year together, but actually to intentionally chew over them, mull over them with him and allow those to continue to have an outworking in your life. I believe God has great things for us this year. Fresh things, new things, a mobilization of his people. And I believe that it starts with us humbling ourselves before him and making room for him to do a bit of a clean up in us. Again, not because we will be perfect or never have incongruence in our life, but so that we get into the habit as his people of of regularly allowing this realignment, regularly checking in, allowing the Holy Spirit to check in with us and say, oh, there's a bit of slippage here. Let's see if we can tweak that. Remembering that's all done in his kindness and his grace. Not necessarily his comfortableness, but definitely in his kindness and his grace. So I hope that you picked up communion this morning. If you didn't, our wonderful ushers are at the back. So if you just pop a hand up, they'll get um, a little container of um, communion to you. And I don't want to rush us through this process, so I'm I'm just going to ask... um, for you to take a moment now to allow the Lord to speak to you. We're taking communion now because it's only by the cross of Christ that we are forgiven. It's through the cross of Christ that this very great grace is extended to us and that we can live at peace with God not because of our ability to manage a congruent life all by ourselves, but in the absolute acknowledgement that we are utterly dependent upon him. And so I want want us to come to him and examine our hearts, and then we'll take and eat together. And um, the prayer team will be available as the service comes to a close. If you want prayer either in anything to do with what the Lord's been stirring in your heart today or any other thing that you're wanting someone to join you with prayer with. But can we take a moment now just in the quietness of our own time before the Lord?
We thank you, God, for your very great grace towards us, expressed through your Son, Jesus. As we come to the table this morning, Lord, the table that you've prepared for us, we do so, Lord, with an acknowledgement that each and every day we will have failed somehow in our thoughts, our words, or our actions. And that you have made provision for us, Lord, to come to you, to confess our sin, to receive your forgiveness and your cleansing from unrighteousness and to be set free. It's our heart, Lord, to live wholeheartedly for you this year. Lord, to allow you by your Holy Spirit to show us the areas of incongruence in our life, that we would live more boldly for you, more wholeheartedly for you. And we take communion together this morning, Lord, in full acknowledgement that we are utterly dependent upon, dependent upon you. And we receive your grace and your mercy and forgiveness towards us with grateful hearts. Can we take and eat together? Thank you, Lord. We thank you for your blood shed for us, Lord Jesus that we are cleansed and washed. We take and drink together. Thank you, Lord. You are welcome not to rush away this morning, whether that's um, joining in fellowship over a cup of coffee whether you still have that weighty sense of the Holy Spirit prompting you with things and you want to come and just quietly do business with the Lord up the front here or in your seat, if I can just ask if any of the prayer team are here this morning, if you'd be willing to just come up to the front um, and be available for prayer, that would be great. God bless you this week and uh, I really look forward to gathering with you again next week. Just a reminder that after the service next week, we have a fellowship lunch, a sausage sizzle, so come ready and prepared to stay a little bit longer. Amen.